my name is Russ Johnson, as Tolian said, and um, I want to, last time I was here, I got a chance to talk with you, whoever was here, and those who were listening in, about, uh, I got to talk to you about finding, fear, uh, finding freedom, I guess you could say, um, from this very popular idea of God. And today, if it's okay with you, I think I'm going to continue in that. I, I needed that. <laughs> Starting to question my, my thinking there for a moment. Um, and if it's okay with you, I'm just, I want to just go ahead and kick things off with uh, just a, a little bit of, of my week. I, I lead a ministry right now called LARC. And uh, at the core of LARC, I guess you could say, is really just helping this big, broad world that we live in really see what God is really like through what Jesus really did so they can walk in a freedom they already have. And we recently started this thing called the, the You're Not Crazy Tour. And so me and a couple of guys that, that work with me have uh, been hitting a variety of cities. We've got like 40 more that are on the map that we're going to be going to over the next year. Just hanging out with people who are starting to really wrestle with what they were handed in the name of Jesus versus what Jesus actually said. I know there's like three of us in this room who can identify with that. And uh, while I was on the, on the road, I got a chance to sit down with a guy named Charlie. Charlie's an elder of a church in St. Louis. And uh, he's kind of on the fritz right now. And as he, I was trying to press him a little bit in this big backyard cookout that we were having, like, hey, man, what's really going on? You seem like kind of like down. And this very large dude um, began to just break down and cry right there in front of me. I was like, man, something's really bugging him. He said, Russ, right before I came here for this cookout, um, there's a young lady that my wife and I have been ministering to in our neighborhood. She, um, she's working through a variety of things in and around her sexual identity. And recently she said, I think Jesus is Lord, and I'm pretty sure he's my only hope, and I need to get baptized. Can you do that? And he said, by all means. So they, uh, they went and baptized her at the church building. And probably about two minutes after she got out of the water, uh, some other elders from the church had caught wind of this and saw to it that they greeted her before she could make it to the door. With a little bit of a breakdown from the Sermon on the Mount, as they would call it the, the Kingdom Manifesto or the Kingdom Playbook this Sermon on the Mount where you really start to see what it really means to follow Jesus. And they began to break down for her the things that she needed to get really serious about if what she just professed is actually true. And he said, man, my heart literally just broke because she sat there like a deer in the headlights as she looked at me and looked at them and looked at me and looked at them and didn't know what to do or where to go. He said they started off with the whole bit about, hey, if you're going to follow Jesus, you got to be nice, like really loving. Because being a Christian is loving your neighbor better than anybody else can, right? For those of you who have a moment of honesty right now, you're going, I'm not that good at it. <laughs> I mean, I gave a guy a one-finger salute on the way here this morning. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? For cutting me off, for crying out loud. <laughs> and then you're like, wait a minute. Oh, yeah, there it is. No. Basically, she was told she needed to be like Ted Lasso. You got, you got to be that person who just gets, gets all kinds of stuff dealt to them on a daily basis, and you just smile with that mustache and perfect hair with that slight accent and say, well, I'm sure you're just having a bad day. The good news is, day's going to be better, right? And she's like, okay, but, but I mean, Jesus said, like, if you even just... You guys just told me, like, if I even just have anger towards somebody, I'm doomed. Like, if I just even think it. And then there's that whole verse in there for some of you who have read that in Matthew 5, where that word raka is. If, for if you've even said to your brother, raka, right, then you're, you're condemned to hell. And you and me are going, I don't even know what that word means. <laughs> and just so you know, neither does anyone else. <laughs> no one really knows what the word means. So we're all kind of wondering, like, uh, where do I stand? Then she went on with, they went on with uh, struggles with lust. Sexual purity was something she really didn't have to step up her game in 
that she's going to follow Jesus. I mean, if she even thinks it or feels it, right? You're already, you're already condemned. You're already out. Might have to pluck out one of your eyes. And for those of you who are following that road, right, you're going, but wait a minute, I got another eye left. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll get rid of both of them then. Well, then you've got this whole like thing called a memory that you can, <laughs> that you can operate off of. In other words, I don't think Jesus is saying what we think he's saying here. And they said, look, these are the things you're going to have to step up and get serious about. And it says it right here in the scriptures, let your yes be yes and your no be no. You guys ever heard that? Yeah. It's this popular idea, I guess you could say, of Christianity as like morality. It's like morality in action, I guess you could say. That this is this thing that we've grabbed onto. The Spirit's going to be a guide to you. Hope you can make it happen. If you're really serious. Let that yes be yes. But the more I study the Scriptures, I'm pretty convinced that all of our yeses have already fallen flat. Would you agree? Like if you're just honest, right, with just even your, what goes on within your own heart and mind on a daily basis, your yes and my yes has already fallen flat. And according to Jesus, that is not the end of you. The public exposure that comes from that is not the end of you and it's not the end of me. It's actually the beginning. Because morality has never been sufficient to save anybody. Morality isn't even the point. In fact, if you want to go down that road, you could say morality eventually can actually cease to be moral altogether if you really want to run down that one. That's kind of how my week continued. See, I flew home from, went to St. Louis and Louisville and Danville and Lexington and Cincinnati, and I came home and I went to my office. And for some of you who don't know this, my office is a, it's a bar in Fort Myers where I live. It's a true story. Um, I was working out of a coffee shop, but you can't drink coffee all day long. And, uh, you know, after like 10 a.m., it just doesn't taste that good. So I turned to beer. 10.05. Just kidding. Sorry. I, re I really am just kidding. Um, but made myself laugh. That's bad when your own jokes make you laugh. Dave Chappelle would not be impressed by me right now. So I go to the bar. And um, there's a place that I just got to know. I got to know the owner there, and I got to know one of the managers, and I just kind of built this relationship eating lunch in this place. And lunch led to questions about Jesus. And the friendship of just being there and just, you know, with the people that are in and around me led to more questions. That led to them bringing in their friends on their lunch breaks to meet with me with their questions. That resulted in the owner giving me a stool at the bar, writing chaplain on the back of it. <laughs> True story. Um, they, they call me the, uh, the 1025 chaplain. And, uh, and somehow, some way, in starting a ministry, leaving the pastorate after 15 years, I wound up becoming a pastor again. <laughs> and I have all these wonderful conversations out of this place with so many different people from so many different walks of life. One of my neighbors who knows that I office out of this place is a local business owner who was going to an event just the other night in Fort Myers, and it was an event with all of these different lawyers and business owners who were getting together to talk shop. And there was like this cigar tasting and other things is at a local cigar bar. And he goes, you know what? I got an extra ticket. I know Russ is at his office. And so he came by my office, and there I was, and he invited me to come with him. He put me down as the spiritual advisor for Arden Insurance. <laughs> Again, true story. So I go to this event, and uh, I'm hanging out there, and I have different people, you know, they're working the room, and different lawyers are walking up to me, hey, man, what do you do? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> they're like, I actually like that answer. That's better than the ones I've gotten so far. You want to hang out? Sure. Well, it, one, one lawyer led to another, to another, to another. And before long, there's this whole community that's hanging out and chatting about Jesus at this event at a local cigar bar. And with it came all the questions. And you know what the questions were? Not about what God's really like. 
They weren't questions about what Jesus has really done. They were questions about what do I really need to do to inherit eternal life? And where do I currently stand with my scorecard? Can you please offer me some relief? They got handed the same kingdom manifesto, the same kingdom playbook that the young lady was handed in St. Louis. And they've been carrying that boulder on their back their entire life. There's a God out there who made me. He's laid out a really long list of things that I need to get really serious about or else. It's kind of a sad reality. So I started hanging out with him and just started chatting. I'm like, well, you guys familiar with that story that Jesus told about the, the rich young ruler who went to him and had the same question that you guys had? What do I need to do to inherit eternal life? And they're like, yeah. Well, did you hear how Jesus responded? And they were all like, yeah, man. It made me really nervous. <laughs> to which I was like, well, that's what I'm here for. Free drinks and making you nervous. And... Uh, we started chatting about it. And I said, no, I think there's something that Jesus is doing there. I think it's something that he's doing throughout all the scriptures. I think it's the same thing that he's doing in that place that we call the Sermon on the Mount, where you rattled off all those things that you feel like are boxes that God handed you. And I hope you're really hoping that you, uh, you've done your part in checking them. And they're like, yeah, man, like, like he said that he did all these things. Like he's obeyed all the law since he was a child. And Jesus like looks at him and he's like, good, you've done all that. Love it. Go sell everything you own and give it to the poor and come follow me. And he walked away sad. Like, I mean, does he really mean that? I'm like, I don't know. Does he really mean pluck out your eye if you're struggling with lust? Is Jesus advocating self-mutilation? Well, I don't think so. Well, then maybe he's actually saying something very different here to this rich young ruler. You see, you could try to run down the moral code road to see to that you've really done enough. And you can take the people that are in and around you that you care about, that you're hoping, that you'll not just hang out on this side of eternity, but you get to actually hang out with for the rest of eternity. And you can hand them the kingdom manifesto and the boxes of check and hope that they can perform well enough. But eventually we have to stop and go, man, the good deed of day approach that we grab onto instead of having to sell everything we owe, it's not enough. Give $100 a month. Well, why not 1000 Why not 2000 Why not give away everything, like Jesus said? And eventually you find yourself looking at that going, well, but if I do that, then, then my children and I will be homeless and hungry. Exactly. You see, eventually what is moral ceases to be moral altogether. Because morality was never the point things that are good and of God that we can walk in, they're beautiful and they definitely can bring about harmony in our relationships with each other. But they've never been enough to raise the dead. And the last I checked, Jesus didn't come to improve the improvable. Or as I got to actually chat with that young lady while I was in St. Louis, he did not come to redeem the redeemable. He came to raise the dead. His message is not formation, it's forgiveness. His invitation is not to get it together, it's to give up. Take up your cross, okay? Literally means take up your cross. If you're wondering like what to fill in the blank there, take the word cross out and add electric chair. Because it's all it is is a, cap, a, a tool of capital punishment. We miss that all the time. I don't know about you guys, but anybody who's ever been to the electric chair, I would not describe as aspirational. <laughs> like, like, normally when we meet that fate, there's not a whole lot we're bringing to the table, right? And I think that's what Jesus is driving us to from the beginning of his teachings all the way up until he literally breathes his last. That's where he's leading it. That's where he's leading us. But I get the tension that these lawyers had. I get the tension that these elders had. I get the tension that this young lady had in light of what's been pushed on us in this kingdom playbook, Sermon on the Mount, Christianity nonsense. The kingdom is a king and the king is already at hand and he didn't hand anybody a playbook. Last I checked, he didn't, he, he said it is finished on the cross. He didn't say tag, you're it, right? 
There's no playbook that's coming into the picture here. And man, that's something that we need to grab onto, and it's definitely something that we could share with our neighbors and our friends and our family members. Because this carrying this weight around in the name of good and God has just got to end eventually, right? At some point. Because the beauty of what we've really been invited to gets lost in the process. But again, I get the tension. Best as we can see it, I wrote this down. There is always ample reason to pretend that you and I are doing well. The discomfort of exposed weakness presses us towards self-righteousness and feigned decency. We live out our days in front of everybody else, aiming to convince this world and God and mostly ourselves that we are on track. And so we make every effort to interpret Jesus' words to return them to the realm of the possible. It's natural to bend the scriptures, I guess you could say, to make them fit within our capacity to meet them. But what I want to propose to you here today is that Jesus, throughout that blessed Sermon on the Mount and in other occasions, like when he's talking with a rich young ruler, is deliberately provoking a crisis of capacity for humanity. Did you hear that? Jesus is deliberately provoking a crisis of capacity for all of us. He's actually showing you what is really righteous, what the law really demands, what morality carried out really does look like. He's doing this out of his love, out of his grace. Paul referred to this law that I'm talking to as the ministry of death. The ministry of condemnation is what he calls it in 2 Corinthians. Its job is to crush us. To bring about a beautiful wound. So that when we come face to face with what's really demanded, we, 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 look, we look at this and go, I ain't got it. And the Savior looks back and says, yeah, I know. That's why I came as a Savior, not a guide. You didn't need a model to follow. You needed someone to save you from the propensity of thinking that you could somehow save yourself. You didn't need formation. You needed forgiveness. People who are drowning in a riptide need a rescue, not a raft. I guess what I'm ultimately saying is that what morality demands isn't sufficient for what we actually need. We can go as far as saying that Jesus has invited us, caused us, you could even say, to feel like moral failures and this for our good. And it's hard for us. Baxter Kruger described it this way. And I'm just going to go ahead and read this to you. He said, a lot of us wrestle because evil is constantly whispering it's unending in our ears. I am not. And it seems like the most obvious thing to the world. Of course I am not worthy, not lovable, not acceptable. If I'm honest with myself, the proof is everywhere. How could God even look at me, he says. So ashamed and hopeless, outgunned and trapped, we know we are doomed. We dare not face what this means. Rejection, abandonment, the abyss. The pain of it all is intolerable, you could say. Are you ready for this? So we run. We run. With all our might, we run. And why shouldn't we? What option do we really have? So off we go on a 30-year bender. We call it love. We call it marriage and friendship. We call it work and vision. I love that one. That's where I get stuck. We even call it a burden for the lost and the hopeless. Are you ready? Some of you, he says, may even call it worship and obedience to the Lord. <clears throat> but it is our pain and our false God driving us to hide, driving us to something somewhere that gives us a moment of, are you ready for this? Relief. Everybody do me a favor and just do this. <sighs> Relief. And relief can be a million things in this world. For some people, they try to find their relief from fending off 
uh, everything that's trying to erode the righteous right of the world. For some people, they're trying to find relief by being that person who exposed John Gruden's emails. <laughs> the list goes on and forever. Keyshawn, Keyshawn Johnson was recently talking about what happened to Mr. Gruden. And he said, you know what? I always knew he was a fraud. To which case I went, well, of course he is. So are you. So am I. Are you guys ready for this? So are all of us. We're all a fraud. Our yes has already fallen flat. Our ability to keep what is demanded is not possible. It's never been possible. And the God who made us never said, get it together and try to find some way to possibly achieve this thing. <laughs> that was never the point. And somehow that gets lost when we look at the scriptures because it's almost like we miss all the parables that Jesus tells, all these stories where he reveals what God is really like and what he really demanded. So let me just pull all this together and just go ahead and tell all of you right now who are listening to this, and myself included. When Jesus was being pressed by a group of religious leaders, the moral police, you could say, we find them everywhere in our society right now. Just turn on the news. When Jesus was being pressed by this crowd because his message was forgiveness, to a world in need of resurrection. They eventually decided to come after his authority. And so if you go to your Bibles in Matthew chapter 21, you'll find this little interaction that they have where they're calling into question everything that Jesus is saying and saying, by what authority can you do this? By what authority can you do this? And Jesus literally walks them to the realization of what he said in John chapter 6, verse 40. When he says, you guys, really quick, you're wondering by what authority I speak. Well, instead of getting into a squabble about that, why don't we just do this? Why don't we just settle on what the highest authority has actually declared his will is in the world? Do you know what God has declared his will is for your life and 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 my life? You know what he declared it is? In John chapter 6, verse 40, Jesus said that you would believe in the Son in whom he sent for this is the will of God. Did you know that? The will of God, if you're trying to figure out what that is and where that little dot is and what kind of map you need to put together so you can find it and really harness everything in and around you so that you can become this person that Jesus would never have to die for in the first place. <laughs> As if that was possible. Instead of wondering about that, you can stop right now and just rest assured in this. The will of God is that you believe in the one in whom he sent. The one who came to give his life for your life and my life. The one whose resurrection is your resurrection and my resurrection. The one who announced my father's dealings with the sin problem of this world are finished. You are forgiven. Can we just get back to the party now? For the love of God, please, can we just get back to the party? Can we just kick our feet up for a moment's notice? Can we go cook some ribeyes to perfection and pour a glass of wine and cheer? Because from what I can tell in these parables, that's exactly where Jesus keeps walking us over and over and over and over and over again. There's stories about what God's like. Shepherds who leave their entire herd to go find one lost one quickly find themselves out of the sheep herding business. That story is not a model, guys, for business, just so we're clear. Laborers who pay their, who pay their employees who showed up 30 minutes before quitting time, the same that they pay people who have been there all day long, normally get hit with labor infractions. Again, not another model for how to run a good business but a great story about what God's really like. Fathers who throw parties for wayward sons are generally rightly rebuked. But what does Jesus tell us our papa's like? 
He's the one who meets us far off. He runs to us. And before we can even get a confession out of our mouths, he restores back to us all that is his. In other words, he does what? He forgives. It's who he is. It's what he's like. It's the business that he's in. He doesn't hand his probation. He throws parties. There's a big difference between those two. I have a very rough background. I can tell you about these things. Some of you are like, he's been on probation? <laughs> Don't worry, it's just last year. <laughs> so let me read this to you before I close. If you want to go to your Bibles in John, I'm sorry, in Matthew, chapter 21, verse 28. Jesus says, what do you think about this, guys? This conversation we just had. And he tells this story. He says, a man had two sons. And he went to the first and he said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and he went. And he went to the other son and he said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And right there, he kind of walks them right into this place where, in a sense, he like kind of traps them. Not maliciously, I don't think, but graciously to help them see the end of themselves. Which one of these guys did the will of his father? And they said, the first. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. These men had just condemned themselves with their answer. They don't realize that they're second sons. They're not the one who heard about what God's really like and said, I don't know, man. I don't know. But then later on went, you know what? <laughs> I think Jesus is who he said he was. I think he really did what the Bible says that he did. And he's my only hope. That would be the first son. The second one would be the one who postures themselves, the one who has spent his life saying, yes, God, yes, God, but never actually did the will of the Father, which according to Jesus is what? To believe in the Son in whom he sent. They were so caught up in this idea that morality is what is needed, that morality is somehow sufficient that they completely miss the very character of God, the nature of humanity, and what he's graciously done to meet us right where we are. Forgiveness. That's the beauty of the gospel. Your good name and my good name, as I said when I started here, <laughs> as someone uh, who has said yes to God has already fallen flat. So please, when you hear, if you hear anything I say this morning, please hear this. There is life and joy in letting go of pretending that you are fine. There really is life and joy in letting go of pretending that you are fine. The horror of exposure is not the end of you. It's actually the starting point. According to Jesus, a lifetime of folly is swallowed up if we only dare to take the Son at his word. He speaks with the authority of the Father, and the Father's will is that we believe in the Son. And if you spent your whole life saying no to him, well, you're in good company. <laughs> but today, even right now, it could be that moment where you go, yes, yes. Your death for my death, your resurrection for my resurrection. Or as I tell my kids who are older, guys, at the end of the day, it's Jesus or bust. The final judgment, according to what Jesus tells us in that little parable that I read to you, the final judgment of God will not be between those who look the heavenly part and those who didn't. The final judgment of God will only concern this. 
belief in the Son. That's what Jesus says. So you are free. You're free to free fall into the grace that is God. Amen? Amen. And you don't have to hedge your bet like Adam and Eve and bring a parachute. You don't. Public exposure is not the end of you. It's the beginning. You're in good company. God is a good God. We are a desperate people. So can we just get back to the party now? Because my guess is there's a lot of neighbors around here. And the last thing they need is another pious Christian coming along with a to-do list or some imaginary boxes that they checked. And you know darn well you didn't check any of them if you're honest with yourself. But what they do need is someone who looks at them and says, yeah, you wrestle with that? Yeah, me too. And let me tell you what I'm learning about the God who's already met us where we are. And if there's someone who's saying, no, 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 I got this. I'm just trying to figure out like how much of everything I got to sell to inherit this eternal life. You could say, well, you can try to figure that out if you want. Or you can join me and my friend Russ and a lot of other people around the world and say, last time I checked, Jesus already gave everything because we couldn't. Amen? Let me pray.